Thank you for listening to The Luminous Mind, episode 92. We hear about the good shepherd. Well, a shepherd leads his sheep. He walks before them. He will not use his staff to punish them. His staff and his rod were used to protect the sheep. Benjamin Franklin once said, Do not curse the darkness, rather light a candle instead. If you are ready to set your mind on fire, then prepare yourself for the Luminous Mind with your host, Rebecca Bowman. Today's fire starter is Donna Goff of Mentoring Our Own. Hear the conclusion of our conversation as she mentors us on parenting and home and family and school. We left off with our conversation right here. We put all of our eggs in one basket. We put it all into educating for a nine to five job and we totally abandoned for them. Well, I can't say totally. There were some pockets throughout the country, but a majority of the children raised after World War II were raised for a career, and they were not raised with any kind of skills to run a home or take care of a family, because they weren't raised alongside their moms doing the stuff. Yeah, exactly. It became a a latchkey generation, so we put all of our eggs in one basket for a nine-to-five life, but nine-to-five is only one-third of our life. And it's not even one third of our life because it's five days, not seven. Well, and the life satisfaction, too. You know, you know, a lot of people that are doing the nine to five job that we've all been trained to do in our public education. But you just don't see people as fulfilled as they are when they follow kind of the natural instincts of taking care of themselves. What would you say about that? Well, I would say that we feel as a society, we're either into education I'm not education, work. So educating to work only, not an education for life, or entertainment. And so when we're out, we're just entertaining ourselves instead of communicating and building relationships and things. We're finding people are getting married older and older. We're seeing a lot of singles in society. We don't know how to build relationships. Now we're finding in 2005, Stanford and Berkeley did a massive study of 14,000 students across the nation, preschoolers. Now, this is the first time they looked at children from advantaged homes. Prior to that, the studies that they have been, even Obama brings forth the study about, oh, what was it? It was in 19, mid-1960s, and it was in Esplanty, Michigan. It was about 168 kids, and they were from broken homes and inner city And they sent teachers out to those homes to teach the moms how to raise their kids and to do things that would enrich them. And then the things that they were doing in the preschool were totally non-academic. They were all interest-led. They were all developmentally appropriate. Well, and they were in their homes too, right? I mean, don't you think the home is a, a more relaxed, comfortable learning environment as well? Well, they came to the homes, I think, twice a week. But what was going on in the school where they were doing this high point study, they had it all child directed learning by centers and things like that. The kids were not sitting down having to do reading, writing and arithmetic, you know, like they're doing today in our schools. They've preached this study for the last, what, 40, 50 years. And of course, they never tell the downside. Yeah, and that's what we were kind of talking about before we began recording is that so many young people feel the need to to put their children in preschool based on these studies, but it's not even like it's not mimicking exactly what happened where they did see the success. That's true. When the president spoke, he talked about this study and he didn't mention it by name, but he mentioned it at other speaking engagements. So I knew it was that study he was referring to. And then he context switched. He said, you know, wow, these kids, there were fewer pregnancies, there were fewer dropouts and all this, and and they followed it for 40 years. And then he says, we have children starting school today that don't know their ABCs, one, two, threes. And I'm going, okay, that's not what that study was about. And so parents hear that and they're thinking, oh, my child's not ready for, for school. School readiness before was talking about, could you take directions? Could you sit still? Could you pay attention? Did you have 
balance and coordination. Those were the kinds of things that they were looking for. And kindergarten was used as a stepping stone from home to public school, being able to respond to a different adult. It was half day and it was play. It was play-based, just like this previous study was. Well, in 2005, when Stanford and Berkeley did their study, they decided, well, if we're taking kids from advantaged homes and we teach them math and English and things, they'll be standing on the shoulders of their advantage and, wow, we're going to be able to show how preschool is really good for kids. What they started finding out was the more hours children were in preschool that were from those advantaged homes, the more aggressive the children got. Harvard also did a study about the same time on several thousand children as opposed to 168. Uh, <laughs> and found that many of those children developed attachment issues, making it difficult for them to form attachments later. Well, and what you were just talking about, that we don't know how to form relationships anymore. That's based on the lack of the relationships that we had with our own families. Is that correct? Yeah, during that first three years, you're building trust because when a mom responds to her child, the child knows that they can trust that person. But when the mom pushes the child away and puts them in a academic situation, they become dependent on their peers and they become dependent on other adults. And that may sound good up front, but it causes a lot of developmental issues too. They also found that these kids that were doing the language arts part for the Berkeley Stanford study, that many of them had language delays. Because the language we have in home when we're talking with each other and discussing things and talking about current events and reading stories out loud, it's a rich culture in the home. And when we take children out of the home and we cubby whole language into this little process that we do, they're not getting all that rich language experience that they would normally get in the home. And so that backfired. The children that benefited the most from the preschool were Hispanic children whose parents didn't speak English. So it became an English language, native tongue approach for them. And for children who were inner city kids that had no home life. So again, it showed some benefits, but the benefits for them still weren't huge. We're talking a few percentage points. We're not talking landslide, this is going to make your child be an A student type of thing. And we also have to remember that Normal development of a child is you could have a fifth grade classroom and you're going to have children in that fifth grade classroom that are two years above grade level down to two years below, sometimes a three year spread. And that's why in some areas of the country, they will allow you to grade skip or hold the kid back. They usually don't do that unless they're three years above grade level to grade skip them or three years below grade level when they would hold them back. A lot of states test homeschool children, they put the test threshold at 13 percentile. That means they have to function at two years below grade level or better in order to pass the test. And all these parents are all panicked. My kids got to pass the test or they're going to make them go to school. Well, they can't hold a standard to homeschoolers. They don't hold the public schoolers. And the fact is you can't force the brain to learn before it is developed and ready to do so. That's the problem that we're seeing with Common Core as well, with um, may probably no child left behind, but then moving on to Common Core, is that we're trying to force uh, children that aren't developmentally ready. And then what does that do to their desire to learn later on in life? Well, it shuts them down. A lot of people never open a book to read on their own after they leave school. But here's a comparison. The one-room schoolhouse, children entered when they were ready, and they exited when they were ready, and they moved at their own pace. Okay, and basically it was a mastery type program. You moved through as you mastered the skills below and you just kept moving forward. Okay, we move into the cities and they start with a premise. We've got to keep the kids off the street at least six and a half hours a day. And we need to keep them off the street for at least 18 years, you know, until they're 18. And then, well, we've got all these kids that have moved into the cities from the countries and all these um, immigrants coming in. We can divide them up by age, but the child doesn't learn by age. When I hear people talk about age appropriate, there's no such thing. It is development appropriate. Not every child the same age is going to be on the same page. That's just a fact, and it doesn't matter how much you drill and kill, and you can put 
a hundred kids in the classroom and put them in the same program and they're not going to thrive. They're not going to move out forward at the same level, even if you give them all independent teachers to help them to do that if they're not developmentally ready. So anyway, if you're going to try and keep kids off the streets and you're maintaining that they need to be in school for another three or four years and you don't add a whole lot more to the curriculum, maybe a little bit at the top end, the last two years of school, what do you do with the textbooks if you don't have everybody on the same page? The textbook has to be teaching at a level below the middle of the class. It also has to have a lot of review. It's not because children learn and forget. It's because children never learned it in the first place because they weren't ready. Yeah, they when just it, kind of pick it up whenever they finally are ready. Yeah, so they keep so. on recycling it every year. And the kids that get it and move forward are bored to death. And the kids that don't get it yet are bored to death because it's not for them. And so the system that we created of graded curriculum isn't working. And another thing that the textbook also has to do, it has to keep a classroom of 30 kids doing something so the teacher can work through the classroom. So it's a classroom management technique. So that textbook is managing the classroom, trying to catch kids that are below grade level, maybe been exposed to it before, but maybe they'll catch it this time. Also, it has to have problems in it for the children that did get it the first time through that are at the top, but most of it's for the kids in the middle. And so we take those textbooks and those methods that were designed for a classroom of 30 kids and we try to use them in the home. It's not a mastery-based program. It's a curriculum-based program. And the Common Core, they reverse engineered from high school backwards. It wasn't done by people that know how the brain develops and how children learn. Well, like we said, I mean, we just seem to think that if we try to teach it to them earlier, that they're somehow going to grasp onto it sooner. But, And I would imagine the children that they aren't grasping it just start feeling stupid, especially when they see a few of their peers around them that finally are grasping on it. And then maybe that also slows down their development because they shut down emotionally. Would you agree with that? Or? Oh, I agree with that and get the kids shut down in that. There are kids that will play the game and that will treat it like a game, but others just shut down. There is a reason why we have a huge dropout in our programs in this country. Some areas are 30%. When I graduated from high school, my high school graduating class had 1,000 students that entered as freshmen. Only 600 graduated. Wow. And that was at a major high school, you know. And I look at that and I think we have the same curriculum, what's the problem? I had a kid in sixth grade ask me how to spell this. And I looked at him and I thought, I was totally incredulous. I thought, wait a minute, I've been in school with him for six years. I didn't understand. I didn't understand that distractions in your life can delay benchmarks. And the elementary school I went to, even though I lived in a nice neighborhood, the right next door to it was one of the most notorious housing projects in the country at the time. And so these kids had great disadvantage, alcoholic parents, beatings, you name it, that were interfering with their education. Yeah, violence in the street type of thing. Yeah. yeah, it was it was it was pretty rough, you know, for them. You know, I look back now, my heart just uh, bleeds for that. But what can we do? What what can we do differently? The brain of a young child grows by use, not by academics, not by the flashcards and and things. I mean, although they might be able to get something out of those, it grows by use. It grows by our our senses, by what we taste and by smell and by touch and by hearing and by seeing and by physically doing, moving our body in space. So children need those long walks. They need the time in the park. Taking them to soccer practice a few times a week or even for a little time each day is not enough. It is no substitute for free play. In fact, adult-led sports was not a thing when I was a kid. And other than a few of the boys did Pop Warner football and softball. But a majority of the kids in elementary school, we would get together and it was Sandlot. We organized our own games. We developed relationships and skills that do not happen when you're just being told what to do and you're part of a team. Yeah, I didn't really think about that, but that's definitely how I was raised, too, that in those younger grades, when we were part of a sports team, it was definitely a student-led. You gain leadership skills, you gain, you know, thinking through problems 
type of thing versus like like you said now now we're just entertaining kids and trying to keep them busy so well i would suggest that people read dr raymond moore better late than early it will give them a perspective of what can happen children should be working alongside their parents and serving they should be read to take walks with them take them to museums have a rich environment but don't stress over having them read at three or stress over having them read at five. I had one of those two boys that were taught the 30 words would ask me, what does that sign say? What does that sign say? And one day I came home and he was sitting on the couch reading a book. I did not teach him how to read. By the time he was three and a half, he could read better than the sixth graders at church. And I did not sit down and teach him how to read. I did not teach him phonics. We didn't have a TV. It was over at a friend's house, and they had Sesame Street on and or Reading Rainbow. I can't remember which one, and they were doing Silent E. He got a skill. He came home, and he started applying it, you know, and that was him. <laughs> <laughs> then he had a sister that was reading scriptures with us but went to school and was not reading independently on her own. They had the specialist working with her who was the principal of the school, and she wasn't reading, even with all the things they could throw at her. Third grade, she comes home. That summer, she decides, I am going to read. She went downstairs, got her brothers hooked on phonics. Her oldest brother had it for spelling, and he never used it. And so she went into the playroom, put the headphones on, never knew she did it. When they tested her at the end of the summer, she was two years above grade level. Holy cow. When she When she had left, At the end of the semester, before, she was two years below. She made that much progress on her own when she decided she wanted to. Well, all of her younger siblings were completely homeschooled from the get-go all the way through. When her younger sister wasn't reading independently about the same age, I stopped stressing, and I just let her bring me the, the reading book when she was ready to do it because I didn't want to make it a battle. And she is a wonderful reader. She is a wonderful reader. She learned how to read. And then her their younger sister didn't have any of that problem. Well, we find out later that the one that read at three and the one that read at nine had the same IQ. They just learned at different paces. And, 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 different, and different ways and different distractions and developed in different areas. The brain develops differently for each child. And to realize that brain development is not IQ, that a a child with a a high IQ can be a late bloomer as well as an early one. Yeah. Well, we think of some of the great scientists like Albert Einstein and some of those, some of those people, they they weren't reading or anything until they were mid-adolescence. Yes. Edison um, wasn't reading at nine and a half when his mom took him out of school. And she would just read to him each day. She read to him from, I think she was reading uh, Will Durant's history series and Rise and Fall of the Roman Empire and stuff like that. If I remember correctly, don't quote me on that one. (laughs) She was reading history to him and she had to do farm work. So she'd leave him wanting more by closing the book and go to her work. Well, as a teenager, he got a job working on a train. And he would ride into Detroit, into Dearborn every day on the train into Detroit and in the morning and then in the afternoons when people were coming home from work, he would ride the train back and and work on the train then. Well, he decided to spend his time in the library in Detroit. Detroit Free Library has about 3,000 volumes. He started working his way through the stacks. Well, he had enough breadth and depth of information on how things work when he was done doing that, that it's amazing. He has more patents than anybody else ever. And here's a kid who wasn't reading till he was nine and a half. Yeah, exactly. Before we go on, let us take a minute and hear about our sponsors. Homeschooling but need help covering all the important subjects? Want to make sure you're thoroughly covering science, history, civics, trying to get arts and language skills into your student homeschooling? How about creative writing? The answer is Connect the Thoughts, a proven secular curriculum for ages 5 through high school. For over 10 years, Connect the Thoughts has improved educational results for over 20,000 homeschoolers. Hundreds of parents, student success stories tell the tale. Connect the Thoughts, the best homeschooling curriculum available. Use the link at theluminousmind.net podcast show notes page and download free samples today. Welcome back 
to The Luminous Mind with Donna Goff on Mentoring Your Own. So what encouragement or advice would you give to parents? Looking at my generation, I didn't have my children do preschool, but that sure is certainly the push. And then, you know, a parent who has a child that's struggling like that, what advice would you give them? Go back to the beginning, work with them, have them work with you, do dishes with them, work in the garden with them, tidy with them, fold laundry with them, listen to them as they talk and validate that they're a human being. Even if it sounds redundant, even if they're talking about the same things, listen, but then expose them to new things. Take them to the park, look at things wonder how did that snail get in its shell and build its shell let's go find out what happens to that caterpillar you know and and search that out go to the museums take them to listen to beautiful music enrich their life give their mind something to feed on don't hand them a handheld device to busy them so that you can get the work done quickly you cheat yourself and you cheat them you cheat yourself because you're not teaching them how to work And they'll never be at your level to work with you. And you cheat them because they never get the skill and the work ethic that they need to take to all the tasks that are hard in life. Well, I'm just thinking about kind of our our earlier conversations of how we go through chores and all of that. I just wondered how you would also change that mindset for parents. And that's just something I'm just having a hard time wrapping my head around about. They They get to that. They get to a point where they can do chores. But there is a book. It's a fun little book. It's a Christmas book by Pearl S. Buck called Christmas Day in the Morning. And it's a glimpse into farm life. The man's oldest child is a boy, and he's worked next to his father all his life. His father didn't give him farm tasks to go do by himself. They did them together. Before Christmas, the boy hears the father and the mother talk. And the father says, oh, I hate to wake him up. I hate to wake him up on Christmas morning. And all of a sudden, the boy realizes, my dad loves me. I want to do something for him. What can I give him for Christmas? And then he thought about it. He thought, I'll get up really early and I'll do all the farm chores the way he taught me how, to the T. I know exactly what he expects, how he wants it done, how he wants everything cleaned up. I will go hay the horses and everything, and I will milk the cows, and I will get it all done before he wakes up. And so this boy goes out there in the wee hours of the morning and wakes up the cows to milk them. And he milks the cows, and he feeds all the animals, and he gets all the milk in the milk canisters, and he covers them with a quilt to keep them from spoiling. And he goes in the house. And he climbs in bed with his clothes on and pulls the blanket up over his head. And his dad comes in to wake him up and says, oh, son, it's Christmas morning. I'll meet you out in the barn. And the father goes out in the barn and he sees all the work's done. And he realizes that his son has grown up and he comes up to his son's room and he just hugs his boy. And he says, this is the first Christmas I've ever been able to be here to watch family open their presents. This is a great gift. And The story is told from the perspective of the young boy when he is 50 years down the road remembering this. And it was such a classic that it resonated with people because they had experienced that on the farm of growing up, of getting to a point where they could grow up and they could handle the full work. But they need the patterns of habit. If we take the pains to train them in the patterns of habit and expectations and quality and follow through and finishing, and if work is worth doing, it's worth doing well, when they get to the point where they have to do it on their own or they get to the point where they want to show that they're grown up because they want more privileges, they start showing initiative. And sometimes it comes as a dance. They'll step in and step back and step in till they gain their confidence and do more and more. The minute they do it the first time is not the time to come in and assign them to do it the rest of their life. Allow them to move into that and they'll grow into it. And I, generally speaking, I feel that the first eight years is learning how to work, learning to work with the parent, learning to develop the habits, taking care of yourself. That's the time you learn how to dress yourself and how to groom yourself and all that. Also, how to take care of your things and how to order and organize your room. And if you grow up with that, if it's not being done for for you and to you, but done with you, it becomes your nature. You prefer it that way. And one day you come in and that bed's made already. One day you come in and you realize they haven't um, left toys everywhere. They put them away because they got tired of picking up the mess. 
and they preferred it clean because they could find what they needed. It's a maturing process. And I figured generally the ages 8 through 12 is a perfect time for them to work side by side with you one on one on the deep cleaning tasks, not the general stuff that you can do with everybody. But they're not big enough before that to really reach the top shelf in the refrigerator to help clean their fridge. And it may be closer to 10 that they're ready for that kind of training. But you incorporate them into those routines that you do on your own that the other children are not physically ready to do yet. And now they're being trained as your shadow. By the time they're 12, they know all of the routines of running the general home. They know how to cook the meals. They know how to do all of the work, all of it, every last bit of it. And they've done it. They know the standards. It's been patterned in them. Then they're ready to have dominion over a whole system like cooking meals or cooking dinner or handling the laundry or taking care of the yard because they know every last facet of it and they've been trained in it. And somewhere between 12 and 14, they're about ready for that. And I think part of it is puberty, when the brain changes, when they begin to understand abstraction better. It's the time that they're ready for algebra. It's the time they're ready for learning grammar. It's the time they're ready for doing composition and detail. That's middle school age. But it takes a heap of training to get them there. But once they're there, they're like a comrade. They're right there. They're your bud. They can do it. Hey, mom, don't worry. I can handle this. I know that you have to take care of this. Or mom, don't worry. You're morning sick. I can do this. I can get dinner on. Yeah, that's pretty neat. I mean, I didn't realize that was a, a side benefit, you know. And, and like you, I think a lot of us have had to relearn how to parent <laughs> because it wasn't it wasn't there when we were growing up. So a lot in the scriptures, you'll find it in the Bible. You'll find nowhere in the Bible that it talks about chores. You'll find nothing that looks like assigning chores to little children. But you will find in Deuteronomy that it talks about teaching side by side as they rise up and as they lie down to teach your values to them, your God. And the only way you can do that is if you're actually active parenting with them, working with them, learning with them exploring with them, enjoying life with them. So homeschooling is really just active parenting like that, (laughs) you know. Yeah, it is active, purposeful, loving, nurturing. And one last metaphor, we hear about the good shepherd. Well, a shepherd leads his sheep. He walks before them. He'll go to that field and he'll clear the noxious weeds that will bloat their stomachs and kill them. He will not use his staff to punish them. His staff and his rod were used to protect the sheep. He would tap it along the canyon wall, and they would follow him by the sound. If they had fallen and they couldn't right themselves, that they were falling a hole, he would use them to help correct and pull them up gently, but he wouldn't use it to beat the sheep. And if we take the good shepherd, instead of being a sheep herder, sheep herders drive their sheep. They stand behind them. They yell at them. They have dogs barking at their heels. They drive their sheep where they need to go. We want to take the lesson from the master to lead, to show the way. And we can do that for our children. It will change the way we parent. It will change the way we educate. It will change the way our relationship is with them. And you'll be surprised how capable. At first, it will look like they're not learning as much as their peers. But we have to distinguish between what their peers are actually learning and what they're being taught. Just because somebody taught somebody something doesn't mean they learned it. Just because they sat through six and a half hours of school doesn't mean that they really got out of it what the educators intended them to get out of it, okay? Yeah. And it doesn't mean that they know more than to regurgitate it, that they can use it as a skill and a tool. But if they're doing and experiencing these things in the home, at first, it won't look as academic as the other. But when all the others are shutting down and are done and want to play... Then your children, who have had the opportunity to play and develop their brains and their hearts and their minds, are ready to really go deep and really take hold of it. And wow, what what they can do with their education is incredible. Well, and they won't stay stuck in that perpetual teen life that we see so many people, you know, even when they're parents and stuff, all of a sudden they just, you know, run from responsibility. So do you have any other resources? I mean, you mentioned Dr. Raymond Moore, Better Late Than Never. Am I saying that correctly? Yes. And Uh, 
Do you have any other ideas of things that we could use? A Thomas Jefferson Education by Oliver DeMille. Another one is Leadership Education Through the Phases. I think that's what it's called. And it's by Oliver DeMille. And what it does is it takes you through the phases of child development to help them build that center core of their values and then stand on the shoulders of that and build a love of learning and nurture that curiosity and that love of learning as a foundation for scholarly level learning when they're in junior high. It's an incredible program. Charlotte Mason's also very good, and she teaches a lot about the discipline of habit. She says, parents, you need to lay down the rails. Take the time to lay down the rails, and the train will go along that because we are creatures of habit. We're either going to be following bad habits or we're going to be following good ones. Why not good ones? Well, and if you do it, um, you know, the whole scripture, like you said, raise up a child when they're young and then they won't depart from it. That's that's really true. I and mean, we see so many people in our society kind of doing the opposite where they just leave their children. And then, you know, when they really start to struggle in those teen years, all of a sudden that's when they're clamping down and wondering what to do and, you know. You know, those type of things. I also think it's interesting how you use scripture in order to, as a guide of parenting. And we hear that a lot with our relationship with God of how he leads us. But we really never take that to heart of how we should also parent, you know, using that advice. So I think that's wonderful. Well, that's an aspect. And I do have resources on my own website. My blog talks about all these types of things that I've been talking about. My newsletter every month is free. And I try to cover a home education topic one week, a home management or home culture topic another week, a mom culture, taking care of yourself. You're the key. If you don't take care of yourself, if you don't feed your mind and your heart, you won't have it to give to your children. And you have to do that first before you start thinking about what philosophy of education or whatever, because if you don't take care of yourself, you burn out. Well, so if I you're not a happy teacher either. <laughs> They're not going to learn from you very well. I mean, you know, work alongside you very well either. And if you hate work and you hate school and you hate learning because you had a bad experience, now is an opportunity to cultivate that love of learning in yourself, to develop good work habits and attitudes about work so that you can benefit your children as well. It will raise the whole level in your home. Anyway, with my newsletter, mom culture is the third thing. And then the fourth thing... Um, once a month, I try to let people know something that's on special. I do mentoring. I do group mentoring. I do individual private mentoring. I also have webinars that I do. Once a month, I do a free live webinar on a topic. This last month, I did one last week, actually, on the power of an hour. What can you do in one hour a day if you got in that habit? I taught them three things. You can cover scripture. You can read a classic. And you can focus on one enrichment. You can focus on art and spelling or music and grammar, uh, learn math or science, focus on that for 20 minutes. 20 minutes is about the uh, attention span of most children. And it's even less for those who have spent a lot of time on handheld devices because their reaction is what it's building. And the reactive part of your brain is not the organized frontal lobe where you have your organization your um, executive function, your stops telling you to stop doing this or to do that. That's the last part of your brain to develop. And if you're spending it all the time being entertained on a handheld, you're developing your impulses in the back. Yeah. And that goes for children, but also adults, correct? Yes. Yes. So you end up with attention deficit issues. (laughs) Yeah. As an adult. (laughs) I'm saying saying computers are bad or that you should never play games on a computer But in the developing mind of little children, I would minimize it greatly and not entertain them. Put them to work with you, read to them, sing, play music on the radio if you don't, you know, I mean, just have a rich life. We've come 6,000 years plus of modern man without handheld devices. And look at what we've created. Yeah, and we were talking about the generation, you know, the education that we had years ago, how short it was, and all of the creations and inventions that were made on that short of an education. Yeah. Why can't we do that now? (laughs) Well, 
Like I said, um, our schools were built on the factory model. They were to prepare children to enter the factory to work and keep them off the street until that time. And so there's a lot of stuff in the curriculum and a lot of practice and everything else and a lot of drudgery that is unnecessary. It doesn't take 12 years to learn what they need to learn. It doesn't take six and a half hours a day. If you cultivate good habits and you build a love of learning, the rest of it is the easy part. Yeah, the fun part to watch, definitely. So before we say goodbye, do you have like a final words of advice or favorite quote you'd like to share? And then please just go ahead and give us your contact information. We talked about how rich your website is. How do we get to you? Okay, my website is mentoringourown.com. M-E-N-T-O-R-I-N-G. O-R-U-O-W-N dot com. Mentoringourown.com. I'm on Facebook. I'm on Twitter. I have my website. Do you have pages uh, for Mentoring Your Own or is it just your personal I uh, do Facebook? Have a page. I do have a page. I have my personal page on Facebook. I have a Mentoring Our Own page. I have a Mentoring Our Own group for people that are using the resources so that they can discuss, you know, that. And... Um, Quote, couple, one of them is be the change you wish to see in the world. And that's Gandhi, but he was quoting somebody else. <laughs> and uh, let me think. Another, life's too short. Enjoy the journey. Yeah. Don't make it difficult. Don't make it harder on yourself. You know, when you look back at the last 30 years of homeschooling, homeschoolers paid the price, got into college. Some of them did tedious uh, school at home curriculums others did not they had rich environments rich education if you read oh I know one um, homeschooling for excellence uh, Mike I think it's uh, Mike and Nikki Colfax okay Col- Colfax they had three kids that they adopted two of them uh, oriental child and uh, uh, african-american child and their own child that homeschooled and she tells what she did and they got into Harvard oh yeah I think I've heard of them Harvard, and she says I didn't um, I didn't do uh, a curriculum with them they would study when they didn't want to do farm work and then they would do farm work when they didn't want to study it was a really nice uh, balance there and it was driven by what they were ready to do and one boy wanted to run cross country so he practiced running the hills of Ukiah, California, and he got um, he was the first kid to get on Harvard's cross-country team that had not been trained by a coach Wow! At, at a high school. So, I mean, there are hundreds of stories out there, and, and we have been so brainwashed in the thinking that it has to look a certain way. It's the skills that we're trying to get. It is the, the broad knowledge we're trying to get. It is not the curriculum we're trying to get through. Exactly. So like you said, you teach that love of learning and, and some hard work and the rest of it follows. So, well, and <laughs> so. That's, what my, that's what my group mentoring does. In my group mentoring, I help parents work through first taking care of mom and second, um, how to assess where they are and get a vision and map the journey. And then I start taking them through how to teach children of multiple age levels and to actually develop individual skills on the way in little as maybe two hours a day, one hour general learning, and then the other hour for um, uh, individualized learning in in small blocks of time. That is incredible process. I worked out with my own kids. And I also talk about how to work with teens that are high school age. And then, um, oh, and my universal record keeping system, which can be used with any curriculum, but it's one that you do as a family first, and then you teach the children how to keep their own, and they keep their own portfolios. Hmm. That's interesting. And it, and it becomes their own. It can actually morph into their own curriculum if it's used right. So anyway. That's great. So that's what I cover there. And <laughs> my last words are enjoy the journey. So that's for sure. I think too often we we think it's drudgery having them home, but before we know it, they're up and gone, and um, we aren't. We haven't enjoyed that time, and it can end up being a wonderful time if we do. So, 
So, well, thank you so much for joining us. It's been super fun talking to you and kind of picking your brain and having this discussion. I appreciate your time. Well, thank you. I mean, there's so many resources I couldn't cover here. And like I said, <laughs> I, I cover it in my blog and my newsletter and my webinars. They're free life and for the first 24 hours. So I try to make it available to the least of us, the ones that struggle the most financially. But I have it there at all different levels for um, people to benefit from. Yeah, and just the emotional support, I would imagine. I mean, like you said, that we've been brainwashed. The rest of society has their idea of how they think education should look, and sometimes you just need to go someplace to be reassured that you're you're okay. <laughs> and be pointed toward resources. Exactly. And, and studies. I've got some studies that show where they completely did things different than what we're doing right now, and the children were far ahead by yeah. not teaching regular math and not teaching regular language the way we teach now in elementary school and saving that till junior high and just teaching them hands-on and uh, oral composition, learning to express themselves first. When they got to junior high, they were able to teach all the stuff that they would have learned in the first six years all in one year, and then they would excel their peers. Wow. So I've got, I've got those studies. I mean, I have the things that are reassuring that says, yes, mom, you can do it. And it doesn't have to look like what you went through. Sounds more pleasant, too. <laughs> yes, it is. It is. It is. And people can, you know, email me. They can Facebook me and contact me through the website. So Great. All right. Well, thank you so much for your time. It's been super fun. Well, thank you for uh, having me on and for this opportunity to answer your questions. It's been a very enjoyable afternoon. Great. Thank you. Thank you for listening to The Luminous Mind. To learn more about Donna Goff and mentoring your own, go to our show notes at theluminousmind.net. Be sure to become a subscriber to our free email list and consider joining our program by going to the scheduling tab to become a fire starter today. Help support the podcast by making all your Amazon purchases through the free Amazon widget on our website. Also, sign up to receive two free audiobooks from Audible at theluminousmind.net. Like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter and Google+. Get our audio content on YouTube, iTunes, and Stitcher. To help us grow, consider telling your friends about us. Leave us a review. Tell us how we can help you so together we can continue to light minds on fire and change the paradigm of education. 